our seminar series on the politics and economics of transition in the Middle East, led by Professor Salehi of Javad Salehi Sfahani. I will just give a very brief introduction to Professor uh, Sfahani, and um, he will give an outline of the plan for the seminar and introduction to the topic itself. Uh, it's my great honor to introduce uh, Professor Saleh Isfahani. He's our visiting scholar at the Middle East Initiative for the fall semester. And um, during this time, he will be leading this seminar study group. Um, Professor uh, Saleh Isfahani is a, um, an alum of Harvard, so um, not new to this area. He got his PhD at Harvard um, in economics and uh, is a, a professor of economics at Virginia Tech, but also has uh, appointments as a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and a uh, research fellow at the Economic Research Forum in Cairo. Um, he is widely published. Uh, more specifically, he has authored two books, Models of the Oil Market and After the Spring Economic Transitions in the Arab World, and edited, edited two volumes, Labor and Human Capital in the Middle East, and The Production and Diffusion of Public Choice. His many articles and publications, and uh, we're just very pleased to have him with us um, for all the fall semester. He's planned a, um, a fascinating series for us. and. Um, Please join me in welcoming Professor Saleh Hesfahan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. for that nice introduction. Uh, I uh, had meant this to be more of a discussion group and with a table and we sit around it. Uh, we, we might just be able to do that. I feel a little awkward standing here like I'm having a lot to say, have a lot to say. Uh, whereas what I'm really trying to do today is to spark conversation and to try to uh, invite you to get you interested if you're not already to come to the series. We have uh, six outside speakers and maybe a seventh will be added. Uh, one more in September, then uh, four in October, or, and then one in November. Uh, this is not working, so I'm going to have to talk a little bit uh, without it. Uh, so you, you all know, obviously, where the poster is, where the series is. Uh, and we have put, uh, I have put readings for this talk, and I will place readings, maybe one article, maybe the article the author is going to present. Some uh, speakers d decided to present a particular paper. Others will speak more generally. And uh, I invite you to go visit that web page and uh, maybe even read the uh, article, an article or two before uh, you come here. Okay, good, it's just in time. Uh, so my purpose today is uh, not really run through what they're going to say, but uh, do two things. I want to offer some stylized facts about economic development in Menom sort of creating a common knowledge among the group, hoping that you will come again uh, after today. It's going to be actually more interesting after this. Uh, so you can ask short questions from our speakers and generate some kind of coherence so that by the time the talks end, uh, even though the speakers aren't lined up to cover specific issues and go deeper and deeper, that we will eventually create some depth about economic transitions and political transitions. By the way, I'm an economist, so I tend to do mostly economics, but I like to talk about politics. I added politics in part because I didn't think there'd be many people. Uh, so now there seems to, it, it seems to have worked. Uh, uh, so what I do today is uh, mostly economics. At the very end, I like to indulge, uh, talk a little bit about political transitions and what uh, this particular view uh, that I present here implies about political transitions. So after I uh, bombard you with some graphs, and I try to go fast over it so that there will be time, uh, you're going to hopefully 
can you stop me in about 30, 35 minutes? Sure. Okay, so that we have another 35 minutes or so, 40 minutes for, for, for discussion. And, but we hope to be able to keep that uh, for future too. Uh, so after I've run through a bunch of graphs uh, about the facts of Middle East development and mm -hmm. economic transitions, I'm going to uh, focus on some key issues that interest me uh, which is uh, mainly my research background, uh, youth issues, and uh, then try to link that. Uh, youth issues and inequality, those are the two things that I work on, on the Middle East. Uh, and I want to then link that to uh, political transitions at the, very, at the very end. So what transitions are we talking about? You know, you can name it what you want, you can think about from tradition uh, traditional society to modern society, you can think from author authoritarian to pluralistic. And uh, mostly, I uh, would like to think of the transition as, uh, again, an e economist's uh, bias perhaps, from big state to dynamic private sector at ease with globalization. Uh, some of what I say is actually about modernization of the family, of the people. I'm very much aware that there are two Middle East, the Middle East of governments and the Middle East of ordinary families. And in fact, the way I approach, uh, most economists approach a country is through the lives of the average person. Uh, this might be the fault of this connection here. Okay, good, I'll touch it. So. As I go through the talk, and perhaps as other, others come to speak, uh, we will better define what we mean by political, by, uh, political and economic uh, transitions. Certainly there is modernism in it. Certainly there is uh, increasing democratic participation. Uh, but at the core of it, I think, uh, is going to be a change in the economic system uh, from big government state leading economic development to uh, private sector and to individuals and families taking control of their lives, not expecting a big leader to come and change things for them. Uh, if you want to uh, interrupt me for a brief question, question of uh, uh, clarification, do so, but uh, otherwise let me finish and then uh, I hope I've provoked you so that there will be enough discussion. Let me clarify a couple of myths that watching Al Jazeera during the Arab Spring uh, made me very angry. You know, it would talk about Libya and then it would say poverty. It would talk about Tunisia, talk about bread, lack of bread. It's really uh, insane to confuse Libya, which is an oil-rich country, with a poor country. It's also kind of unfair to look at Tunisia as a country uh, which is unable to feed its people. Even Egypt is doing quite well. So I want to dispel some of those myths about the stagnant economies and high poverty rates. It's been fashionable to talk about these, society, these economies as stagnant and needing some outside intervention or some explosion from inside to get them going, but in fact, they weren't quite standing still. So let me show you some of these graphs quickly. This is GDP per capita, which is the main indicator, indicator of uh, uh, economic development and uh, summary for increase uh, sta is state of average welfare in the country. Uh, that's Libya, you know, you can see it's a high middle income country and it was doing better and better. Uh, in, the 90, in the 2000s. Uh, all the countries are put here, uh, among them Tunisia, the yellow, uh, and Egypt, the blue, were doing all right. These are not countries stagnant or in decline, whereby you expect a, an uprising in order to set things straight. In other ways, they were also doing okay, uh, specifically with respect to education. In fact, this is a kind of a clue as to what might have gone wrong uh, or what might have caused the disappointment uh, that was on display during the Arab uprisings. 
this is average years of schooling by region, and you see Arab countries, the blue line, have outpaced all other regions, including uh, East Asia, uh, in the speed with which they have increased their average years of schooling. These are World Bank uh, data. So I find that really interesting, that it seems like people are doing all right. Incomes are rising. They're going to school, acquiring more education, yet they seem to be very unhappy. Uh, in terms of uh, education, if you look at specific countries, you see Egypt doing well. The only country that's not doing well is uh, Syria. It's kind of a mystery uh, that Syrians haven't done as well in terms of going to school uh, as the rest of the Middle East. It's certainly kind of an anomaly where uh, schooling slowed down uh, after the 1990s. Uh, but other countries, Jordan is by far the most educated, uh, and then followed by Libya. Libya is an educated country as well. If you look at another indicator, it's not supposed to be here. Uh, my system didn't work. I'll find that graph for you. Uh, it's right at the back. Life expectancy. These are the you know, education, life expectancy, and GDP per capita are the three indices that go to make up the HDI. And by the way, right before the start of the uprisings, and I wrote that in the first page of the paper that I put uh, as a reading for this talk, five of the Middle Eastern countries were picked by the UN uh, in their uh, report, their uh, 2010 report, as uh, the top 10 performers in terms of human development index. Five Arab countries were picked. Among them, Tunisia, then Algeria. And most of it is because of the rise of schooling, which is an important, explains a third of the index, the HDI index, but also uh, life expectancy that's been going up. Generally, health has been going up. Uh, my students are always surprised when they see that Syria had one of the lowest infant mortality rates in the region. So some, th some things they do right, some things they don't do right. And one of the things we try to get to in this uh, uh, series, hopefully, is to uh, find out, despite these things, what went wrong. Uh, and a clue is in the education variable. Uh, there are well-known grievances, mostly coming from youth. They have high unemployment, especially for the educated. Again, that's where I think the focus should be uh, in trying to identify what has gone wrong. Lots of education without reward, disappointment, uh, expectations that are unfulfilled. Not only they have high unemployment, they have long waits to get their first job and to get married and start a family. Uh, a project that Hillary mentioned uh, that I, uh, for which I directed the research at Brookings was about uh, Middle Eastern youth. We started that in 2006 and we uh, sweeped and cleared the offices in 2010, I think a month before the first eruption because nothing was happening with respect to youth according to the funders. <laughs> for the project. Uh, but the book came out that uh, later uh, Tom Friedman made a big deal of, as you know, these people knew what they were doing. We were looking at education, rising education, un lack of productivity of education, difficulty to get married, and difficulty to form a family. Uh, so that's a very well-known reality, the disappointment of youth. What is not so well known is that these societies are also relatively unequal. I won't say highly unequal because they have low income inequality relative to, say, Latin America. Gini coefficients are in the range of 0 0.3, 3, 4, 3, 5, maybe 0 0.42 for Tunisia. They also have low land inequality because of massive land reforms that have taken place since the 1950s after the uh, uh, struggles for independence. So that again distinguishes them from Latin American countries where land 
uh, ownership is highly unequal. What they lack in is inequality of opportunity. What is high in the Middle East, and this is something that uh, I try to again highlight in that uh, short article that I put on the website, and I'm going to talk about a little bit at the end. If you look at uh, what makes, uh, what defines economic development, uh, certainly in the development literature that I follow, mostly coming from uh, Chicago, Friedman, uh, not Friedman, sorry, Becker and Lucas, you see that three important indicators of economic development is fertility. This is about behavior of the families. It's co closely linked to education and it's linked also to income per capita. So these three things are better in my view than the HDI index that has health, education, income. When you put fertility there, you're looking at how families evolve. Relations between men and women, relations between parents and children, those are huge transformations that, according to Lucas and Becker, have defined Western uh, de uh, developments. And when you look at developing countries, they also are very meaningful. And what you see in this view of things is that Middle East has done relatively okay. So this is kind of confirming the graphs that I showed you earlier. I have here an, a series of graphs for different decades. 1980, this is the average number of children births per woman. This is the average years of schooling, and I've picked eight, which is basic schooling, basic education, and it's the compulsory education for most men our countries as a break point. And I've taken 2.5 as the number of children as a break point. And I'm trying to categorize countries according to the behavior of the family, whether the average family has four or five kids or has two kids or two and a half kids. Now I have a break point at two and a half. And I'm also looking whether the young people, this is average years of schooling for 15 to 19 year olds, whether they on average achieve basic education or they don't. If you look at Middle Eastern countries, and I've marked them here in red, in 1980 they were all in this underdeveloped quadrant. You, this purple line is the average behavior globally. So like a regression line, fitted line. And these circles are countries with their incomes. Incomes is the size of uh, the uh, circle. And you can see here uh, United Arab Emirates is here, very big. Kuwait is here. The ones here that are large circles are only oil exporting countries. All countries that are poor otherwise are here. They also have high fertility and low education. And all the countries that are doing well have low fertility and high education. So this is kind of a generalization of the development process. So let's watch, see how countries of the Middle East have done uh, over the decades. In 1990, they had moved quite a distance, but they were still mostly in the underdeveloped region, high fertility and low edu average years of schooling. By 2000, the modern family is emerging like the average person in the Middle East for many of these countries they are coming very close to being quote unquote modern I like this definition of modernization because families that have uh, societies in which average fertility is too you can read a lot into it you can read stuff about how they treat their kids about how the husband treats the wife you know extended family versus uh, and, uh, nuclear family, a lot of things go with this one number, average number of kids. So they're be becoming modern in many ways. And by 2010, which is the last year for which we have data, a lot of the countries are here. Well, Jordan has done very well in terms of education, but they haven't modernized in terms of fertility. It's still a kind of tribal society. Syria is lacking behind Iraq. I Yemen, Sudan are still in the, this quadrant, I have a feeling Iraq is moving very fast uh, into this developed quadrant. A lot of the countries are still kind of at the borderline. They are poised. So the last, this last graph, I characterize this as being poised for development, meaning the people are ready to live in a 
uh, society with sustained economic growth, with hopefully democratic institutions and so on, but they're only poised, they're not quite ready. Why do I say that? Yes. Before you move to uh, uh, out of education, uh, uh, what about quality of, of uh, schooling? Do you, do you have I'm, I'm going to get to that. Okay, sure. Sure. It's hard to get numbers for that, but that's really a key issue. I'm glad you brought that up or you're thinking of that. So in hospitable business environment, states did quite well in the region. All the education rise you see is the work of great leaders, bureaucrats who built schools, persuaded people to come to school, and so on. The trouble with that model is that the government cannot endlessly employ the graduates. So they did that for like several decades and then ran out of place. You know, if you talk to Tunisians today, they probably tell you what is their uh, number. That's the num uh, that's their rank in the queue for getting a public job. Sometimes they wait 10, 15 years for that public job, but they'll tell you I am number 550 and I expect to have a public job in a few years. So it's become quite ridiculous. Egypt had an employment guarantee for all graduates, high school and then university, but again, people just gave up because waiting lines became like 15 years long. That is the failure of the previous model. Raghi Asad, who is an expert in these issues, is going to uh, probably delve much deeper into that uh, uh, next week when he'll be speaking. In order to shift from that model into a model in which private sector, people who pay out of their pocket their wage of their employees, employ the graduates, you had to shift. You had to create a hospital environment for them. And that is has been a very difficult shift. And part of the transition that we are talking about is a transition from state-led economic development to private sector. And a couple of the speakers are going to uh, is Isha uh, Diwan of Kennedy School. Uh, and uh, uh, Shevket Pamuk from Turkey will address issues of private sector development, problems with uh, private sector development. What I'm interested here in pursuing more deeply is the question of education quality. What I want to argue, and I've argued in that paper and other places as well, uh, it's a fairly well-known phenomenon that the graduates of these high schools and universities in the Middle East Whereas they were fit for public jobs, because public jobs rarely require very specific skills, just writing, reading, you know, general literacy. When you go to private sector, you have to have specific skills, metallurgy, you know, engineering, this, that, even better writing, maybe. There is a mismatch between university systems, the whole education system that produced bureaucrats and an economy that requires skilled people for private sector. And not just any private sector, a private sector that increasingly has to compete in the global environment. With lots of other countries that have much better education system that do not have this particular history of the Middle East, a strong leader, strong states, public sector jobs, and an education system that served that system. So one of the big challenges for this transition is to go from state-led education to global skills. <coughs> I want to talk about the disappointments. Uh, it, it's very hard to get unemployment data or put them all together. I didn't. I was kind of lazy. So I just did the country I know best. I had these numbers ready. Youth unemployments are very high across the region. These days, when I talk to my Middle Eastern friends, they say, well, it's higher in Spain. Unemployment of youth is higher in Spain. There is a big difference. Unemployment in Spain, youth unemployment in Spain has been high for the last three, four years. It has been so for the last decade or longer in the Middle East. The other thing is that there is very little turnover in the labor markets in the region. A lot of the public sector jobs, the jobs most graduates go to, our lifetime. So you have to wait a long time for somebody to exit so you can enter. 
Whereas in most European economies where high unemployment of youth is observed, there is more turnover. So young people have a better chance to compete with an older person. So this is a picture from Iran, which is kind of extreme, but you look at the unemployment rate of college graduates uh, in 20s and 30s, you know, it's gone up from 22% to 35% in five years in Iran. That's a huge amount of increased disappointment. For women, it's gone from 36 to 49%. These are university graduates. They're people who have promised that if they work hard, they pass a bunch of tests and graduated, life would be better for them, and they're just waiting. And I think you can see a lot about what is wrong with the Middle East is in this uh, model of development has gone wrong. People didn't think about the end game. It's just like build schools, send people to schools, make it easy. Iran nearly doubled its graduate, its university enrollments in the, in the 2000s. They just opened up a lot of universities everywhere. Some of them uh, called the University of Light, meaning it's all internet based. Uh, so people are all busy, they're all graduating but it's like you put people into a train, they're going somewhere, and when they get out, there's nothing. There's no destination. So naturally, they're going to get very upset, and they do something. So that's my view of what's gone wrong. Uh, the demographic imperative is really big. So here I'm trying to uh, attract your uh, sympathy for these countries. Their demography is very, very uh, inhospitable, if you like, for creating employment. These are graphs I have it for all the Middle Eastern countries. There you are, for all the Middle Eastern countries. Uh, why is it doing this? Okay, I won't touch it. This is the ratio of young people, 15 to 29, to adults. When it's greater than one, that means a 15-year age group is larger than a 35-year age group. All the people who are adults who run these countries are outnumbered by these young people who are waiting at the gate. So that's very important. It's not true for every country. Turkey has a more moderate situation. Korea had that nearly in 1980, but that was the time when its economy was growing very fast. It was poised for economic development. It was exporting. Uh, so it was able to deal uh, with this difficult demographic situation with lots of young people. Iran has been under sanctions, it's been meddling, stagnant economy. You know, things are not go been going well at a time when it's faced with this huge problem. Most Middle Eastern countries, for them, this ratio is uh, uh, at some point crosses one, the red line. That's the bad news. The good news is that all of them fall very fast, especially for Iran. Iran of 2020 is going to be a very different country in terms of demography, in terms of young people, than Iran of uh, now or five years ago. In fact, in the last five years, the growth rate of the youth age group has fallen drastically. If you look at the last few years, it's been going up by less than 1%. Before, it was growing at 3.5%. So you're talking about big change coming from demography. The good thing about demography is that you can actually predict the future with it. Uh, your predictions are more reliable than in economics. Yes? Is that because the youth are getting back later in the process? Is that what's driving that? What's driving this is that fertility is coming down in most of these countries very fast. So the newer generation are much, much smaller. So their number is going to be... Uh, the big cohorts are becoming older in 10 to 20 years. The, the youth bulge is becoming middle-aged. And the new young people who are coming along, there are much smaller cohorts. Uh, Iran's uh, uh, baby boom was from 1979, 80 to 85 during the revolution. Uh, the cohorts became 40% larger. And that any society has a huge difficult time accommodating that kind of a big, big shift. Sorry? The strongest coalition? Coalition. 
Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Research, really the the right. How much exactly, that's right. So we can talk about that later. Let me run through some more of these uh, graphs that generate sympathy for how difficult life is uh, if you were running a Middle Eastern country. What would you do if you were an Iranian leader and a f few years ago, maybe 2009, when they had the big difficulty with the um, Ahmadinejad re-election, for every person who retired, six person entered. Compare that with Korea, where less than two people enter for every person who retires, and compare that with the United States, where like a one and a half person enters for every person retired. So economic growth is, in this country, about getting that half a person a job. <coughs> in Iran, it is about getting five people a job. And this is a situation for most of these countries. I'm going to put these slides uh, on the web page so you can look at them later. But uh, a lot of them hit six. You know, Jordan, uh, Syria. Look, Egypt is looking much more normal than Syria. Uh, Algeria and Libya. You could tell the countries that are in trouble are the ones that have hit this six ceiling. Getting to education quality. Middle Eastern countries are not very poor, but their education, uh, the expenditure they've spent per person, per student, has not really generated as much schooling as it does in other countries. This is a global experience. All Middle Eastern countries are below the line. That means they spend a lot, but they don't gain, they don't get as much education. If you look to uh, quality, these are numbers coming from international tests, TIMS scores uh, in mathematics and science. Look at this one on math scores. And this is the, like the average for Middle East around 400. The global average is 500. So all of these countries are below average. If you ignore United Arab Emirates, which is very rich, it's almost like a negative correlation. I mean, the richer you are, the less reason you have to learn. These are the actual average scores. Qatar spends most on education. It's the richest country in the world. And it achieved the lowest score in 2007, uh, maybe the second lowest globally. Uh, they did something. This year, I looked up the scores. They just came out. Qatar has jumped by about 40, 50 percent. I don't know exactly what's going on. Uh, but suddenly, Qataris have all become very, very. You you know some you know you know that the numbers are not lying because in all oil exporting countries, girls do better than boys, and boys are the ones who are actually in some sense richer. They have more access to the oil rent. They have less reason to learn. So what we did with these numbers? This is the other paper I put on uh, on the website. We tried to see to what extent the score of a kid at age 14, in universally or globally administered tests, internationally administered tests in math and science can be explained by his or her background, parental background, and where she grew up. It's an interesting study. It's been done for a lot of countries around the world. And we did it uh, for uh, 16 countries that participated in 2007 and some that had participated the year before. So we separated family background, mother's education, father's education, how often they speak the language of the test at home. This captures ethnicity, number of books at home, home environment, computers, internet, and the size of the city they lived in or the village, uh, average school uh, of, and teacher quality. So average school quality, teacher quality in the area where they lived. When we did what is called a decomposition, you look at the variance, which is the inequality in the scores, and you want to see what percentage of this inequality is due to inequality in backgrounds, and what percentage is because of effort. If you look at Europe, let me tell you that first. If you look at Europe, on average, about 16% of the variance in score is explained by parental background. In Latin America, it's about 30%, maybe 35%. Middle Eastern countries, some of them are higher than 30, 30%, 35%. Uh, 
you look at Qatar, for example, especially in science, it reaches 45%. I think it might be a global record. Lebanon has very unequal, opportunity unequal uh, education system, meaning parental background, community characteristics explain a lot of the score, the variance in the score. Uh, Algeria, is, on the other hand, is this country that's absolutely the lowest that I've seen globally. Uh, the referees who were looking at this paper, they said, that is not un that's not believable. You need to really look very deeply. Everywhere I have looked, this looks right. However, it doesn't mean it's a very good country because you can create equality of opportunity by helping the people at the bottom or they can stop them from the top. And it could be that's what's gone on in Algeria. But I don't, I'm not an Algeria expert. I've tried very hard to um, find out how true this number is. Morocco could be a selection problem. Anyway, I don't want to go too much to detail, but I want to uh, uh, bring up this issue that although the societies are equal in terms of, and the governments have done a lot, a lot of these governments have been socialist, they've been clamping from the top, pressing from the top to create equality, preventing people from achieving a lot uh, on their own. Uh, socialism, Arab socialism was good at that, it's creating equality of outcome, but mostly well, helping from the bottom, building schools, building health facilities, and so on, but also <coughs> pressing from the top. But this system, at the heart of which was an education system that was kind of egalitarian, it was all free, failed because jobs increasingly became private jobs, universities became increasingly competitive, and parents entered the fray. They entered with their resources. If you go to Jordan, if you go to Egypt, you talk about private tutoring, you talk about tutor moms. A lot of women don't work in the labor market, educated women, because the future of the kids depend on them staying home, going through the math, math homework, and going. And then they, they hire tutors. There's a whole industry in Iran, for example. I have a cousin who's about 55 years old, and he's a private tutor. He's doing very well as a career. He's never thought of uh, getting a regular job because it doesn't pay as well, a, a, reg a regular teacher job. This is the source, I think, of inequality of opportunity. When you have a system, you're kind of blind, you think it's equal because you built a school. Then at the other end, you, you don't have jobs, all sorts of jobs. You have mostly government jobs, and you have fewer and fewer government jobs. What do you do? You tighten the outlet creating more and more difficult tests. So all these massive kids who are coming with education at the very end, in these big tests, they fail. Or if you open up the university, still the rankings are there. Everybody knows uh, in Tehran, Sharif University is much, much better than some provincial private school. Or in Egypt, uh, AUC is much better, or University of Cairo, and so on. So in the end, unless you're creating jobs, the education system has no way of rewarding kids except by passing these tests. And passing those tests become an industry. And that industry here is known as Kaplan, it's a minor thing. In Iran, one of the richest Iranians runs a test-taking uh, uh, remedial system. He's so rich, his daughter approached me and says, you've been criticizing this system, my father wants to meet with you. He has lots of money he can donate in order to remedy the situation. Because I've been writing saying Iranian government needs to employ a lot of private tutors for the poor. Because unless they can get their own teachers in public schools to do better, they have to do exactly, I mean, equality of opportunity in Iran means hiring private tutors for the time being. I think that if you were a Iranian, Egyptian, Jordanian, below median income, you see a very different world than a person above. The world you see is that you go to school, there are lots of tests, they keep talking about these big tests, national tests are coming at the end of high school, maybe uh, at entering university, and you don't see a chance. You know what you're friends are doing, what people in big cities are doing, you know about all these big test-taking machines and, 
institutions, uh, test prep uh, institutions, you, you already know you don't have a chance. It's like you don't have shoes and you're trying to run, participate in the Boston Marathon. Or you don't have but a wooden racket and you're going to go uh, practice for US Open. You put it down. So everybody goes to school, but inside they know this is a very, very unfair game. The governments set up what they thought was a fair game and it's just deteriorated gradually into a very unfair system and an inefficient system. Lots of time goes into studying for subjects that don't matter, skills that nobody wants. So let me go, this is my last slide, and I want to uh, translate some of these uh, things I've been uh, talking about into how I see the social protests and so on. I did when I was in graduate school here, read a lot about uh, peasant movements, about worker movements. None of what I read then can help me understand what is going on in the Middle East, for one very simple reason, I think about it. It's a very simple reason. Peasants wanted land, and they lived on land. They knew when it was delivered, the promise. If somebody came and promised them land or fault, they knew exactly when it was delivered. It was the government that was going to do it. It was a very simple thing. So you could organize politically around it. You had a goal, you could achieve it. Workers, maybe more difficult, but still, you could organize. Everything had to do with your workplace. It had to do with wages, working conditions. And as you went into politics from protest, you had your eyes where you were, at the workplace. That was the subject of going to Tahrir Square, maybe. That was the object of going to Tahrir Square. Now imagine a young person. Well, when they're in school, they have a kind of a workplace. So things are focused. Although their ideals, their grievances are not really about the school, about the tests, about the cafeteria and so on. It's about what happens afterwards. Not the same as a village uprising or a worker uprising. And when they leave school, they become unemployed. A lot of students, this is very interesting, a lot of students in the green movement are not really students anymore. They're like in their 30s. But they call themselves students because they need a place to connect their, act, their, their activism to. Social class becomes very important when you leave school. While you're in these free schools, everybody's alike. As soon as you become unemployed, what really matters is your daddy's income. If he has a second car, you're doing very well. You can use the car, you can go around, you're busy. In fact, most work uh, sucks because they are boring government jobs or jobs in which you have to compete with China. That's the worst kind of jobs. Those people work very, very hard for very low pay. So if your dad can give you a car to roam around and look busy, <laughs> that's perfectly all right. You're unemployed. Your main problem becomes maybe if you're in Iran, the cops, the chastity police. For the others, it's a very different story because they don't have any place to go. They're unemployed and they don't have a car to roam around with. They can't get married. In Iran, where uh, I know a little bit more, the um, solution of choice has been drugs. So you have a lot of young people in rural areas. It's very interesting that rural youth use hard drugs. Rich youth in Tehran use crystal meth and what's called recreational drugs. So social class becomes extremely important for these people and they can't unite. Unlike peasants, unlike workers who had a place and they looked alike as they were going back and forth between politics and the workplace, the student movement, the youth movement kind of dissipates as soon as it goes out because the rich go one way, the poor go in way. Sometimes they're brought together like when you have a prime minister uh, former Prime Minister in Iran, Musavi, who promised that he would collect all the uh, chastity police from the streets. They all were very, very happy. And you had a whole movement. There was nothing in his economic program about youth unemployment. I read it very carefully. Karubi, the other uh, green uh, leader, he promised housewives a paycheck for their housework, as if that were a major social problem, but had no solution for young people because these have to do with deep social change. You have to go back. You have to understand that where you went wrong from understanding modern world, 
capitalism, private sector. Iranians have created a new word for uh, capitalists. It's called job creator. It's a very nice word. There's a bank with that name and so on. So nobody anymore uses capitalists. They all say, you know, we have to take care of the job creators and job creators. And this is like the Republican Party here. <laughs> they protest to building a new society. I have a little beef here. I'm going to end with this statement. When we wrote about the Middle East, Middle East youth at Brookings, the final chapter was about how we have to get the private sector to like youth, youth like private sector. And there was a backlash to this. There was an article that came out in Ishmael saying, this is the new liberal solution that has been tried and has failed everywhere. Of course it's new liberal because government is not going to hire the people. It has to be private sector and they have to be willing to invest and willing to hire. So you need to have flexibility if they can't tell the youth that they're good, for example, is one of the things I really care about. Universities, if they don't give a very good signal, if this person is on time, is, can write, could, can think and work with people, which is the case in the Middle East, you need the private sector to have more flexibility to pick them up, hire them for a while, and put them away. We have the exact opposite. We have government-style employment where you hire. It's like an Italian marriage. You have to keep them. When the, when the, when the protests started, people, uh, one, one person in this Ijmes article, Middle East Journal, uh, International Journal of Middle East Studies, which is the main journal of uh, general topic on the Middle East, uh, Linda Herrera wrote, criticizing this new liberal idea, said, ah, oh, the young people are generating new institutions. They are doing horizontal, uh, as opposed to vertical, uh, creating horizontal organizations. Twitter, Facebook is really changing everything. Now I remember looking at it and saying, really? Twitter, Facebook are great for bringing things down, but this is not a Zapata movement, this is not a working class movement that's going to come up very quickly, come out and says, what did we want? How do we put it put together? We need X, Y, and Z to get what we wanted. Now, if you're coming from different social classes and you get out of school and then you have a revolution, then all, everybody has different desires, it all becomes extremely confusing where to go. I think you see that on display in Egypt today. So I invite you to uh, look at the economic side, look at the uh, political side together, and try to make sense of uh, the uh, turmoil that we see in the Middle East uh, in a slightly different way than what we see in the popular press. I'm going to stop here. Uh, and why don't you moderate? <laughs>